Hi, this is Jessica DeMassa at the Heise Studio here at HIC 2017. I'm here with Sean. Um, Sean, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, Dr. Sean Powell. I'm from uh, Queensland University of Technology, working with a biofabrication and tissue morphology research group, and also lecture physics at the university as well. And uh, we're working in the exciting research of biofabrication, tissue engineering. Okay, that's fantastic. So talk to me a little bit about some of the work you're doing in terms of biofabrication. Well, so we're working uh, with uh, clinicians and hospitals and looking at trying to uh, produce different technologies around the area of 3D printing uh, and, and the application of 3D printing and additive manufacturing and, and uh, the associated technologies in healthcare to allow us to produce personalized healthcare solutions. So we can look at doing things like 3D printing customized or personalized implants uh, using metallics mm -hmm. um, and then looking at also regenerative medicine solutions, 3D printing biodegradable polymer scaffolds and putting stem cells in and then the scaffolds dissolve away and uh, you know the scaffolds uh, guide the cell growth and, and uh, cells grow and then that's implanted into the patient and sort of regenerating that that uh, damaged tissue or lost tissue. So that's some of the stuff around that, but not just in 3D printing, but the, the technologies that go before that. So okay. the, the scanning technologies and imaging technologies and then the computational medicine stuff around the, the 3D modeling of the replacement tissue parts and, and drawing information about you know how different cells well, you know work and, and uh, in, in these different tissues. So you really, we've been talking a little bit about convergence and how yes. some of these technologies are coming together. So how, how in your work are you trying to unite these things? Like, it, has it been yeah. easy? Has it been hard? Give us some tips for somebody who might be trying to do this, even at a smaller scale with their EMR. Well, right. So, so a part of a big part of our research is developing these technologies in parallel. So they're, they're separate types of disciplines. You know, scanning technology is, is about capturing patient information, right. either using clinical scanning data sets or or using some sort of surface scanning, you know, structured light scanning, or or photogrammetry, or any of these other technologies. And uh, and then taking that to the next level, where you've got computer modeling and computer you know data processing and things like that. Um, but they they need need to work together, and both of these technologies are, are developing you know, and accelerating in their capabilities. And, and then on the other side, we've got 3D printing technology, which then takes the information from the 3D models and, and that drives the, the, you know, hardware mechanism for the 3D printer. So it's, a, it's about bringing all these technologies together to create a single pipeline solution to take it from scanning of the patient to 3D printing of the, the you know, uh, customized or personalized. And I know all of these technologies are evolving very quickly. And so, but how, how far are we from actually seeing 3D printing become more or less ubiquitous in a hospital setting? How far are are we from that? Well, there's different different uh, applications of 3D printing technology mm -hmm. through the health health system. You know, all the way from the the, the uh, you know printing of uh, personalized surgical guides, right. which happens now. Uh, where there's uh, a lot of clinicians now that are working on on uh, 3D printing metallic implants that are customized for their patients' particular needs. Um, and uh, you know, there's other other types of technologies like 3D printing of boluses for radiation therapy or face masks for for burns rehabilitation. And and so 3D printing has has applications immediately, uh, you know, ready to go. And then there's a sort of longer term 3D printing uh, applications like improving implant technologies uh, and, and customization of those. Um, and also looking at, um, then looking at the regenerative medicine stuff. So this is where we're adding cells, you know, the patient's own stem cells and then doing full, you know, 3D printed sort of tissues and, and things like that, so. Now talk to me a little bit about the research that you're doing with ears and 3D printed ears, the, the project that you have going on there. Okay, yeah, so we've got one project at the moment. It's called the Future Here Project. Uh, it's looking at treating uh, treatments for microtia. So microtia is a congenital disorder where some children are born without a fully formed outer ear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes that's associated with atresia, which is uh, where they have hearing difficulty as well. Um, but uh, from, from the ear perspective, we're looking at trying to restore the aesthetic, you know, okay. to help with the, the child's you know, social development and everything like that. Um, and uh, at the moment, the processes are, uh, you know, to create, say, a prosthetic ear is, is very m manual at the moment. You have a, a highly trained, highly skilled prosthetist, prosthetist and, and they, they can, uh, you know, produce a, a re very realistic silicon prosthetic ear, which can then be attached to the child. And then when the child gets old enough, um, we can look at some surgical approaches. So at the moment, everything is very hands-on and, and manual. And some of the surgical approaches involve, say, harvesting costal cartilage from the ribs. Okay. And so we're creating a second side of, of tissue morbidity. And then, and then the surgeon sculpts using that, that cartilage, the, the cartilage framework for the ear. And then that's then implanted under the, the skin of the child's uh, head and then and regenerates that way. Um, and so with the, the 3D printing uh, biofabrication approach, you know, to both say the prosthetic ear and the re regenerated uh, ear, 
or the implantable ear, we're looking at uh, using scanning technology. Um, we'll look at using low-cost scanning technology, using iPhones and things like that to, to, to reduce that. Um, so we can scan the child's unaffected ear, or maybe one of the parents' ear if the child has bilateral microtia. And then we can use that uh, 3D model that comes from that scan data into a computer to create a th you know, three-dimensional model of what the replacement uh, pol um, uh, prosthetic ear would look like and then we 3D print a, a silicon prosthetic ear and that process is, is very non-invasive for the child we don't have to take physical prints and uh, compared to manually producing a prosthetic ear it's very very rapid you know in a matter of hours we can produce a, a highly realistic you know prosthetic ear that's based on the child's actual scan data um, and then in the longer term looking at uh, using that same 3D scanned, 3D modeling information to be able to print uh, scaffolds using biodegradable polymers on the micron scale and then put the child's own stem cells, you know, the chondrocytes, um, the, the cartilage cells into the, the scaffold. And then the scaffold guides the growth of these cartilage cells into the, to the shape of the child's ear, which can then be implanted. And then the scaffold biodegrades, it degrades away over a short amount of time and, and leaves just the child's own cells. So that's a, an idea of completely regenerating the ear without needing to harvest tissue from different parts of the body. I think that's what everybody's probably most excited about when it comes to 3D printing things. Is some right. of the possibilities of just, you know, completely being able to, you know, disrupt the way that medicine is practiced and, and surgeries like exactly that. Exactly right. Yeah. And that, that'll, lower the, that'll lower the cost and improve the access. You know, right. at the moment, a lot of the surgery, so if, if you wanted to have some uh, some uh, implant surgery for, for that microtia, you, you know, uh, often pa parents and families have to save up over $100,000 Australian to, to travel over to the U.S. For, for surgery and, and you know that's a that's a major cost and and they have to move often the family goes over there sure. for, for a period of months for this whole process to go and so uh, you know to be able to offer you know technology that that provides you know superior levels in some cases of, of treatment at uh, you know in a very sort of accessible way will drive down those and keep it costs at home. and keep it at home yeah exactly so so you don't need to have necessarily uh, surgeons which are so highly skilled and trained to be able to you know hand sculpt so uh, you know an ear when you have computer technologies that can produce models from scan data and things like that so. that's fantastic well continue all of the wonderful work that you're doing it's no been problem. so insightful to hear from you i have one last question for you sure. just because as somebody who's really working with bleeding edge technologies you're beyond the leading edge you're bleeding edge <laughs> um what are you most excited about in terms of technology right now well, the unknown is okay. what I love mostly because I have no idea what's coming up next. So we just develop <laughs> it and see what see what if it comes up. But yeah, I like that idea. I like the idea of being able to develop technology, and then that takes you to the next step where you can see the next step forward. But you can't see too far forward because if you can, then it's it's not really that innovative, I suppose. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, you've heard it there from the bleeding edge. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean, for much. joining us here in the Heise Studio. I'm Jessica Damasa. Thanks.